just so you tell us about the work that's behind yeah. you so this is an interactive work uh, installation that um, uh, wants to highlight the connection of uh, empty nature and in the same time full of the earth so actually literally you can see the earth through the figure and um, it's invites the people that are um, viewing it to take a ribbon from that pile and while they are contemplating on um, one commitment, a real action that they can do for the earth, they tie it like in you know ancient Paganic uh, and other cultures in South America doing the same thing. So I wanted to create a kind of a ritual to highlight the, the urge of us to do something and even if on the mini scale um, in an exhibition you can make a commitment maybe you can um, remember that out, outside the exhibition walls. Um, it's going to be a, a, a concept that I'm using in another exhibition that I have around climate this summer in Kosovo, um, where seven of those figures will be hanging from trees and people can do this ritual uh, of tying the, the band and the, I call it, I give you my word. Um, because when I was in Kosovo recently to check the location, um, I realized that it's part of the culture of the place where people are um, um, committing to words and, uh, and their um, promises to each other and it's very, very important to them uh, to do so. So I thought I'd call it, in their language it's called Deja and I translated it to I give you my word. Amazing. And there's another work, work on the floor which uh, deconstructs the word impermanence in Hebrew. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? In Jewish mysticism, you can take a word and break it uh, to many, many other words by changing the location of letters in the word. It gives different meaning and often it's work like a koan, like a question that you don't necessarily have to understand with your head, but you can embody that. And the same here, the language just gives you insights on what is maybe the word meaning, the real meaning of it. So, for example, when I uh, realized that you're doing an exhibition like uh, with the name is impermanence, I wrote impermanence in Hebrew. And I thought, oh my God, with all those amazing words in it. So, the, the word is in Hebrew called arayut. And in it there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words and probably more that make sense to me. And the, the words are awakening, time, air, light, mirror, companionship and island. So I compose a little poem which goes like this. Impermanence, my companion, as a mirror, reflecting space and time, awakening the island within, shining light. So I used most of the words that are in the word impermanence and made another sense to it. So it's in Hebrew is a sacred language, really like Sanskrit, one of those ancient languages. And then I realized today actually that I have a problem with uh, my roots, where I come from. And the question of home always has been um, steering me. And language for me is a home. Interesting. And um, you brought the streets of streets of New York to this place in the southwest of France. Yes, I um, I always um, always kind of a, a, a convertible studio. I'm on wheels, so wherever I am, I'm collecting junk. I'm cleaning in New York. I was literally cleaning New York by collecting a very particular um, object that I'm attracted to, the object that I call them homeless, homeless objects, that are looking for a home. And actually my work eventually brought me to work in homeless shelters in New York. Um, it is crazy how it's, how it, because I would never imagine that I, I'm able to do that, but I did. And uh, so I have something around home, as I said, and um, I, I, I'm attracted to kind of lost and forgotten and discarded objects and, and I want to transform them and give them place in the world.
and uh, I feel that actually it comes from a very strong wish to heal my ancestors, my um, my ancestors like me are looking for a home, and uh, the home is on fire, and uh, it's always a human fire from Bible time, and um, and that does something, you know, and uh, so when I was in New York, for example, I made obsessively all kinds of nests that I now in retrospective I call them nests I, the, when I'm working I don't know exactly what I'm making it's happening in the moment I'm working a lot with chance methodology it's just that I don't know the materials I'm going to hunt I don't know what I'm going to do but I know it's my normal subject and they're just emerging and uh, there is a work behind it that is um, all about that I call it no discrimination because I really have this urge that I just want to um, I want to tie together the whole differences and to make them whole again. And um, on the wall there, there are three works, or is it one whole work? So it was one, and it became three. So I, that's the only well, that's the, not the only one, but it's it's one of the only ones that I made especially for this exhibition. But one of them was already my first work when I came to live by the village. I made um, so I call them flex for um, sorry, the prayer flex, like Tibetan flex. That's a connotation, and um, and again the names always come after. I never, hardly never. Um, no, because I don't know what I'm doing, I don't have a name. Um, but they tell me when they come out what they are. And those are actually also made out of humble materials. Um, they are made out of banana paper. Um, banana paper that, I mean, um, is the base of your banana boxes. And I was attracted to it so much uh, when I came to France. I never saw that before. And I realized I'm attracted to everything that has holes in it. Um, and the reason, if there are no holes, I make holes. Um, and the reason is that I want to be in touch with the holes inside. And with this work, I think after I contemplate why I made it the way I made it, because I work very fast and spontaneously, and I don't, I don't have the, the inner voice that tells me what it is while I'm working, but after that it comes. And, um, and that voice was saying that um, I have a choice with what I'm filling the gaps with. So, so one of them is with stones, one of them is with paint, and one of them is with twigs and red ribbons that um, often come in my work as a, I guess, symbol for freedom. Fantastic. And lastly, the repurposed butcher's hook. Yeah, so that's really, that is my first work uh, when I went to university, Central St. Martin. I was already an artist, 10 years already. And I was working before I started to work with this kind of poor materiality. I was a proper artist. I was, um, I didn't dare to call myself artist then, but I was, well, I was a caravan. I worked with stones and bronze and wood and uh, I put my works around in parks in London, you know, like the, uh, they were for sale and I was, you know, I was just like um, doing mainstream work and I never felt happy, there was always a gap and um, I didn't, I, I couldn't merge that gap and when I started to collect the, the rubbish from uh, Brighton Beach where I used to live, that's when I realized that I need to go and study, I need to understand what I'm doing. Then when all those nests that I described before started to emerge and I, I would collect garbage and make uh, a nest from it and then let it uh, decay and gone. And that was very obsessive, obsessive and uh, so I went to St. St. Martin and in art university you don't really learn anything, they just give you the space to explore and that's what I, I was so hungry for that. And what I understood is that I'm actually really busy with, with my roots and uh, this is one of the first work we had a first year exhibition and uh, that was my first work and in I, I call it white into black because it's about aging but it's actually a self-portrait and um, it's I, I, I found those ropes uh, not in that shape uh, one of them on the beach and one just on the street and I just wanted to love them 
and I wanted to give them a life. I know that they, they have been once in a youth, they've been in service, and they are not anymore. And I wanted to honor that not anymore. And I hooked them on my dead um, uh, butcher uh, hooks. He was a butcher of three generations, and my family of three generation butcher. And um, I had a problem with my roots. I um, I was a sensitive child, and being brought up in a butcher family was difficult for me. So at the age of twelve, I decided that I'm vegetarian. And um, since then, there is something in me that wants to heal that um, that ancestral line. And um, so, instead of putting uh, meat on the hooks, I put uh, sort of pieces of thyme 